This afternoon, I want to thank our media partner, of course, Veranda, and our showroom partner, and that's Made Goods. After this presentation, we're going to go upstairs to uh, the Made Goods showroom in Suite 403 um, for a reception and a book signing. Um, so we can't wait to see you all there, and just be on the lookout for maybe a Made Goods expansion next Ooh. market. So, um, all right, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Steele Marcoux, who's the Editor-in-Chief of Veranda. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you for having us this week. Veranda is so um, excited to be in Atlanta, our hometown, for a few days of programming and markets. And thank you all for coming to uh, this fun, lively, upbeat panel. We're going to be talking about the role of joy in design and what could be um, a more fun topic on a day like today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm so honored to have each and every one of you here with us today in Atlanta. I'm going to start with you, Karen. This is Karen Rideau, a kitchen designer based in Southern California. And a little fun fact about Karen, she is also a winemaker, and I have had the great pleasure of tasting her wine recently, and it's delicious. Um, I also read on another media outlet that Karen has designed over 500 kitchens, which is quite a feat. Um, she has a beautiful new book out, which is how I became introduced to Karen. Um, came out last fall, she'll be signing it later. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to design and, and what your first memory of a room is or was? Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I started in school for business because that's what I was told to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I happened to take an elective class in interior design um, college, and I absolutely loved it. And I must say, three decades later, I love it just as much, if not more, um, because knowledge does, you know, make it different. But... Um, I really didn't have a vision about what I wanted to do, but it was the last year in, um, I went to architecture college as well, and I opened up a magazine and I said, I just want to design kitchens, that's it. And I've been doing it ever since, and it brings me so much joy. <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> Thank do you. Do you have a first memory of a room? I'm always curious to ask this of designers. Um. I really don't. I, I love them all the same. It's, they're like my children. I mean, you can't pick one. But I just, I love a really well-designed kitchen. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So sitting next to Karen is Darren Hanault, a New York-based interior designer who's known for luxuriously livable interiors. And you all will see that in his imagery today. Um, Darren, do you have a first memory of a room? And can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to interior design? Yeah, I, have, I have so many. <clears throat> I mean, I, I used to sit in church when I was a kid, bored out of my mind. I was not into church. And I literally <laughs> would figure out how to divide the space up in these massive Gothic buildings. Like, where would the floors be? And which room would be? And where would my bedroom be? And, where, and it's just a thing I did all the time. That's um, so fun. My dad was in the textile industry growing up. And so, like, this was a thing that happened in my house all the time, sort of touching and feeling and learning how things are made. My father was obsessed with me knowing how every machine and what it did to the fabric. That's so cool. So that sort of started my whole, like, how is it made? How is it made? I'm, a, like, big on how is it made. I love that. That's great. Thank you. And last but not least, we have the delightful Fernando Wong, who is an outdoor living space designer based in South Florida and the islands, I hear. Um, Fernando uh, has just such a great, as you'll see, again, sort of joie de vivre about uh, outdoor living. And I like to think of you as a maestro of outdoor living. Oh, you. Um, can you tell us your first memory of a room and what brought you to the field of design? Well, um, it was, I was probably so little that I cannot even tell you exactly what age I was, but just like you, I was in church with my parents. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I did not know we were going the spiritual <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I knew joy, I mean, it, it is joy. It is joy, because at the end of the day, um, one of the things that my mom was drawing was just the stars and chickens, and I was just mesmerized that I could actually know what those scribblings meant. So ever since then, I have loved drawing uh, 
drawing was the reason what led me to architecture school and interior love design. That. I love that. Four years in architecture, three years of interior design, and then I got a job offer in the state. It was based on my drafting abilities. So wow. that was the reason how I wow. was led to landscape architecture. That is fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Do you, do you ever miss interiors? Uh, no, I think it's quite amusing because um, architectural styles, they can allow uh, interior design to just sort of like resonate and complement it or sometimes can be completely contrasting to an architecture. So <laughs> I'm quite amused about being able to um, have relationships with multiple interior designers and architects and I revere what they do. And I think with that mentality is how you see that my landscapes are mm. mostly uh, like a supporting actor. The, the most important thing is the, the building, the house, and you want to envelop that in a wonderful green space. I love it. So we're gonna be talking about joy and design. And um, before we get into kind of creating joy for your clients, I wanted to ask you about finding joy in the work. Because if you, as the designer, cannot be sort of finding that joy, that sense of satisfaction, and even delight in what you do, of course you can't really spread that to others. So how do you all as designers, and, and frankly as business um, operators, how do, you, um, how do you keep it joyful, and how do you kind of continue that for your teams, <coughs> the folks you work with? Uh, can I actually say something about what you just said? Um, I remember the first time I did a house with a major architect, and I was incredibly intimidated at first. And then I realized, you're a team. Uh -huh. If you're a team and if everybody talks to each other and you bounce ideas off of each other, everybody's work gets that much better. I love that. And that was a big lesson. That was a big lesson. Yeah, and it's sort it's of great. a dialogue back and forth. I mean, there's yeah. a push-pull. And, and uh, you know, they know stuff that I don't know and we start talking about proportion and scale and where the rooms are going to be and how they're going to fit into the space. And uh, it's, that's what I find exciting. Do you feel like you learn a lot from working with? A ton, yeah. a ton. Yeah. I mean, one of the, like, there's a picture that's gonna come up and it has this insane domed light fixture on the ceiling. And like, I hate when people say, what's your style? Yeah. I, I'd rather have them talk about taste <coughs> because mm -hmm. taste is more universal. If you mm -hmm. have it, you can do anything. And that room, that apartment was on Park Avenue and it is so different from anything I've ever done, but that's what made it so fun. Like, I just, my head blew up. I love it. <laughs> it was great. I love that. Karen, what about for you? How do you sort of keep the joy in what you do and keep well, challenging yourself and keep growing as a designer? I'm very joyful um, in my design. I, I love what I do. And definitely in going to work and keeping my team and my, staff, I, I'm always um, telling them they should educate themselves, take a day off, let's go to the museum, they're in Salone this week, you know, they need to keep their joy because if our designs are going to be joyful, everybody has to, um, we like to have a good time. And yeah. to your point, um, my team, including in office and the architect, the landscape, we all make each other better. Stronger. Yeah, and so um, it's, it's easy, but we can forget, and I think it's, um, it's important to keep a happy, happy environment. Yeah, kind of keep it but if you are doing a project and your team is not getting along, either get rid of somebody or <laughs> sit them all down and be like, uh-uh, this isn't going to work. Or like switch, you're not on this project anymore, you need <coughs> to be, yeah, yeah. reassigned. Yeah. Have a beach day. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando, what about you? Do you, as a as a kind of manager of projects and of teams, you know, how do you do? You have any tips and tricks to keep well, it fun? Well, there are several phases in the moments of joy. Well, maybe that first phone call, then when you go and visit the site, and then when you get the first draft of the architects, or um, and then the ultimate joy is when they ask you to come back and they want to spruce up some section of the garden or they just sent you pictures of a family gathering or something that have made their life better. I love that. And that is a great success for what we do. Like someone who is very happy with our work, I think is the greatest compliment. 
Yeah. So that's actually a perfect segue to my next kind of batch of questions, which is I've heard several designers say that their most successful projects are the ones in which they get the most yeses from their clients. So how do you, what's the art of getting to yes from your clients? How do you make it, you know, is there, do you need to make it, them think it's their idea? You know, what's I think that? It's, I think it's listening to them. Ugh. You have to listen, you have to hear what they, what they want. Um, even if, it, if you feel like it's something you don't necessarily agree with, the first thought can be transposed or translated into good. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can get them there on their own idea, right? And the thinking yeah. there, it's their own idea. Darren, you have a great process for kind of getting to know your clients and what their ultimate goals for the project are. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the process? I know, of course, I can't remember exactly I know, I'm like, what I, I threw you a like, curve. What was that process? Um, <laughs> Something. I mean, it, it's, a, it's definitely an interview. Like, they're not just interviewing me, I'm interviewing them. Mm -hmm. Because if they're, if we're not, if this isn't good, I don't want to work with you because we're gonna just irritate each other. Yep. And I don't need that, I'm too old. Um, so definitely, you know, getting to know each other uh, and finding out what they want, finding yeah. out what they like, and also vocabulary. Like, you guys don't have the same vocabulary that we have. Right. So somebody says traditional, it means something to us that right. it does not mean to you. So the whole beginning of the process has to be a purely visual thing, just going, going, going. And, you know, some people will come with literally thousands of tear sheets they've been saving for years. And I actually don't mind that because literally in every single one of those tear sheets, like, they'll say, I like this. And I say, no, you don't. There's something about it you like. What's the thing about it you like? There's it, that, it, that the it's not thing? a whole thing. That's so, Is that this, okay. So Sorry. I literally TV I freak out about making things. I love finding craftsmen. This woman said to me, She's Persian. She said, I want my friends to come into my house and see things they've never seen anywhere else. So everything had to be custom. Wow. Which I love. <laughs> so, That's where I come in. That light fixture is literally, so I walked into Ron Dyer, which does, works with a lot of selenite, and I met Rob Franks, the guy who owns so it, cool. and we started talking. And I said, I want a huge dome. It's gonna be seven feet across. Oh my God. I want wow. tons of selenite. And so this is 450 shards of selenite. Oh my God. The end of each piece has a screw, like a light bulb, and they individually screw into this huge dome. Everyone has its own LED light. And then 150 of them are gold leafed. Wow. And the, like, the carpet is pony skin that's been cut with a million color. Like everything in that picture is so out of my, how I want to live, but, she was so happy, and I, I got to just like Amazing. go off, and that's really fun. Yeah, actually, that prompts me to to prompt you. Um, some people are sort of designing on a more inward basis, maybe for themselves, and others, the project might be about like I want my friends to see something mm -hmm. they've never seen before. Mm. That's that's where I was. Okay, that's what I said yeah. to you. Yeah, is I say to people all the time, who are we doing this for? Yeah, are we doing this for your family? Are we doing this because we want to impress your friends? And that's not a terrible question. Some people actually want to impress their friends. She wanted to impress her friends. Yeah. And she told me. And I was like, great, she owned it. knock their socks <laughs> off. Like, I can do that. <coughs> and it's a very different process with someone who's looking to knock everybody's socks off than it is to somebody who wants to create something that's like super, super three-dimensional and layered and like all about, I do this all the time. I'm like, does it feel <laughs> good, does it feel good? So. I love it. Um, Fernando, this is something that we talked about sort of in preparing for our panel today, but um, part of your role as a designer, especially of outdoor spaces, is getting your clients to actually go out there and enjoy, you know, they've come to you, you've done this beautiful custom design for their garden spaces, but then if they're not actually like engaging with the project after you leave, you know, it's not gonna live on. How do you sort of get them to love their own homes? I, I think that I, I, I try to, most of the time, uh, create environments and it's conducive, conducive for our contemplation. 
Ah. Uh, I think that um, those principles are found in some of those um, classical um, ideas. So center axes are important for me, or how the light is going to be changing along the time of the day, and where we sometimes require structures above us that can filter the sunlight or can protect us from the rain. And sometimes we even implement some air conditioning outside <laughs> and create an environment that is sort of like crafted for them. Look at that but, but, um, but that is kind of uh, when it comes to the outdoor living experience. And um, there are several cultures in Florida, so sometimes the American culture likes to have people congregate around a barbecue area. Mm. But some Hispanic family prefer not to have that happening because the cooking can be different. So uh, that is something that um, that is interesting to me. And But most of the time, I always try to, to strive for something that they can contemplate because I think that calms them down and, and it makes them be at home. That makes sense. Yeah. That reminds me of something that Karen said too, which is the role of kind of sensory design. And so Karen, how are you creating spaces that sort of play to the entire sensory experience? And why is that important for joy at home? Well, I think uh, the kitchen is so intimate and so um, different to everybody. And it defines so many different roles. It could be having to cook for your, your family or your children. It could be a place where everybody joys and comes together at the end of the day, a lot of conversation. And it can be, you know, working and it, it can be a happy place. I think ultimately it's a happy place. And um, so when I talk to my clients, it's real important to get this the kind of information and how they live their lives and their lifestyle and cultures and traditions and foods. All of those are really key um, important things to know. The background information yeah. that's going to go into. When designing the space. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And Darren, what about you? You've kind of mentioned to me the way sensory design is, I mean, I think it's gotten even more important in the last few I, years. I'm, I bet I've always done this. I've done this forever. I, so true story, uh, I'll make it quick. I was doing a house in Beverly Hills for somebody, and in the middle of the house was this breezeway that was all French doors on both sides that opened on either side to these amazing gardens. And we were at the end of the project, and the husband was like, okay, can we stop spending money? <laughs> and I spec, there's a company in Florence that makes the most spectacular silk taffeta you've ever seen. Ugh. And I spec that for those windows. And Alan came to me, he's like, could you just put shiny cotton up? Like, give me a break. And I said, no, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because the first day of spring, when you open these doors, and you walk down this hallway, and you hear the sound of the taffeta moving, Ugh. it's a totally different experience. <laughs> yeah. And if you've got cotton, that's just sitting there. <laughs> so I, I think about the, te it's, again, it's from my dad. Like yeah. I think about the textures and the sounds, and that's a big part of what I do. And also, like upholstery, I can't stand upholstery with spring seats. I like everything <laughs> to have a down seat. Because when I walk into my living room, I want to see the imprint of my kids on the chairs. I love that. Like, I don't want perfection. I want to see that we live there. So that's there's another. There's something really kind of beautiful about, like, signs of life. <laughs> yeah, and it's signs amazing. Of it's so satisfying. Passing and, you know, that, I don't know. There's, is it, do you, do you ever encounter pushback from your clients on things like that? I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't like to have to fluff so And I'm like, yeah. you have seven maids. Like, don't worry about it. Someone <laughs> will fluff it for you. Like, <laughs> give me a break. Uh, you know, some people, uh, the house is, they're more uptight people, or the house is for other people. Right. And they want it to look perfect all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I try to push them towards, like, Let it let's live. get a little softer. Let's get a little... But, you know, it's not for everybody. What about imperfection in the garden? <coughs> it's hard to imagine, but yet it's nature, you know. Yeah, the imperfection of the garden. I, I think that uh, we got several phone calls about things that <laughs> they're not, oh, why the trees are turning brown. It's because they're pushing new leaves, for example. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the new growth. But I think it's, uh, oh, why my, gr <laughs> my grass is getting brown, and it's because the dog was... Uh, going to the bathroom there, but uh. it's just 
it's just a matter of um, finding out what is it that they are observing at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Or they are upset about something else and they all of a sudden they take it with the garden. God only knows what goes on. But um, I think that in terms of the subject of sensory, uh, I think that walking in the lawn can be very therapeutic. Yes. And especially the type of soja is very nice. And if you hear the water of a trickling pool or a fountain, that's quite nice. And along with that, um, as in Florida, we don't have winter, but we do have some balming nights. So you start smelling all the gardenias, and past the gardenias, you have the night blooming jasmine. And then on the dry season, you might have the Stefanotis, Floribunda, just giving you those wonderful fragrance. It's quite an experience to be in a garden, and like you said, the sound for you is Daffodil, but for me, are the rustle of the palm fronts. Yeah. Oh. And that is quite <laughs> relaxing for many clients, so there you go. Hearing you all talk about design in this kind of way, and you know, Karen's talking about joy and gathering in a kitchen, you know, you're talking about the passage of time and the, the sort of presence of humanity inside, and the again, the imprint, mm -hmm. literally the imprint. Um, and sort of the calming nature of being outside and hearing leaves rustle and seeing things change and how important that is. It makes me think that you, um, that your job is actually quite different than what you may have been taught at school. You know, I mean, yes, there are some technical aspects to what you do and there's some business aspects to what you do, but there's a lot of kind of psychological value to what you do. And I just wondered if each of you could kind of speak to that and, um, talk about the challenges, but also the rewards of playing that role for your clients. Karen, I don't know if you can. Um, yes, for sure, first. for sure. Um, because I feel when you first meet a client or introduced to a client, it's, it's very easy to start the conversation and the dialogue about aesthetic and what you like, but I think there's this whole other pregame that needs to happen. <laughs> and that's just getting to know them talking about their family, their children, um, what they like, and it's making them feel important for that moment because mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is to gain trust with each other. That's right. And so um, there is this whole psychological and, and therapeutical, and in, even when you're in the process and your client calls you and maybe they're a little upset because they didn't expect something, it's always like, let's calm them down and get, get back to that, that initial dialogue. And then you can talk about their concern. And I find that once you get to that point, ev there is an answer and for everything. Yeah. yeah, but establishing that baseline of trust. For me, it's huge. Yeah, it's, yeah, really it's huge. And we didn't get taught that in school. No, no but you, <laughs> you, figure that out. you figure it out <laughs> as, as you go. What about for you, Darren? Well, I was also, like as we get older, mm -hmm. we appreciate our homes more, right. and That's you right. kind of just learn by experience. Um, what about me? What was, what was I just? I, I think our job literally is to elevate your your living experience. Yeah. If if you are only hiring us to do exactly what you want and what you think, you could hire anybody and pay them a lot less. You could get an assistant just to do it and tell them what to do. So. You have to be willing to trust that we have 30 years of experience with finishes and color and everything that goes into a home. And my goal really is that you sit in a home that you never imagined you were going to live in. Oh, I love that. It's, it's, I, if, if, if I don't succeed in that, I think the house is flat. Mm. I'm like, oh, it's flat. I mean, that's sort of the ultimate gift, and you talk about sort of better, more elevated living, and I feel like that is really what you're doing with your clients. And it's not necessarily more expensive. No, not necessarily. It's just more three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I love that. Fernando, what about for you? How, do, how is your role as a designer, you know, so much larger than what it might look like? Nice <laughs> shoes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so yours. Uh, I think yeah. that... Um, uh, Right now, we have basically three different markets that we are committed to. is Miami, Palm Beach, and the islands, primarily the Bahamas and some other. So um, some of what we are trying to do in terms of providing a better man for their life 
sometimes is just related to keep it things that are very easy to maintain. Mm. And uh, in that way, may, I might use the flowers of a tree to provide you flower in South Florida. Or I might use the different colors of the foliage to create that change of color. Love that. Just because um, the truth of the matter is a, a lot of people now have multiple homes. And by doing so, the least thing that they want is more troubles with the house. So <laughs> keeping the garden very simple is super important for us, especially because we also do commercial properties. Uh, commercial properties, what I mean is hospitality. Mm -hmm. And they always need to look fresh and gracious for all the people that would come and spend time in the hotel. Makes sense. Yeah. Do you all have advice for the other designers in the room about how to kind of, um, for lack of a better word, market yourselves as, you know, bigger or beyond just like kind of redefining the role of the designer? I mean, are there ways that you, do you find you need to explain that to your client? And if so, how do you, how do you do so? How do you do that? L let me interact here because I, I was kind of surprised in one occasion that I was hired first. That typically never really happens. And when I walk into this particular home that was surrounded by oak trees, and it was just a modest ranch style home. And he said, oh, okay. Uh, uh, and then he said, oh no, Fernando, we are tearing the house down. You are here because we want to protect the oak trees. And, um, and as a matter of fact, if you have some recommendation for French Normandy style uh, architecture, we would like to hear who would you like to recommend us to. So That's that great. was very kind of, oh wow, I also bring another perspective to it a It started project. with the landscape, It How started cool. with the landscape, the protection of the oak tree, so that was quite uh, significant for me. Yeah, and even saying, okay, but and now what kind of, how do you, who should we work with to bring together this vision? Yeah, that was quite, quite surprising. I love that. I love that. I would say, don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. If there are people around you that are, have been doing this longer, you have to think of everybody as a resource mm. instead of like retracting and being like, oh, they're so intimidating. Or, most people really love talking about their own work, <laughs> um, especially people who are really <laughs> successful. So, you know, don't be afraid. And the second thing, two other things. The second thing would be, any single thing that you see through your entire life, take a picture, stick it on the computer. Mm. Because then when time comes for you to do a project, you just flip through those images. And they may not have anything to do with what you're doing, but something in them is gonna like jar your eye and, and make, you know, something's gonna hook your eye. I love that. Um, I was gonna say a third thing and I can't remember. Oh, just learn, like seriously, Learn how people make stuff. Like, go to the iron, the guy who's making iron furniture. Go to the guy who's making light fixtures. Go to the guy who's doing drapery. Go to the guy who's weaving textiles. If you know how things are made, you're a much better designer. You're a much more effective designer. It seems to me that you then would know not only how to use those materials, but also how to sell them to your clients. I and mean, people love a story, right? Yeah, absolutely. And bring your clients to those places. Yeah because that's when they get, like if you're doing a custom iron table and it's more than they wanted to spend, Come get them in there. And yeah. once they see this guy making this thing, they're like, oh, I get it, I understand. Yeah, that's amazing. What about for you, Karen? How are you, what's your advice for sort of um, being able to expand your role as a designer for your clients? I would say number one, be authentic to yourself. Mm. Um, we all have so much to offer and Everybody's vision is different. And just really be true to yourself. Um, and, and it's easy to look at all the other great designers out there, but take what you want to make yourself better. And also I would say collaboration. Yeah. Um, when you're starting out, it's, it can be very intimidating because you don't have the experience. You don't have all the tools necessary to you. But it's okay to collaborate with another designer. Most of us are very open to it. I get a lot of work for inter from interior designers. And especially when you're starting out, if there's a style that you want to uh, approach another interior designer, would you collaborate with me on that? I love Number that. one, you're getting two thought processes 
in one, it makes you look better. And number two, you you can really learn a lot from the process. That is great advice. Yeah. And liberating somehow. Oh. Just, you know, it's... <laughs> well, I think we live in this world now where everything is at our fingertips and um, the more seasoned designers, I would love a younger, newer designer to come and say, would you work on this for me? Because it's a, also a teaching experience. That's great. Yeah. And, and something that you said about said to be authentic, you know, Karen, has, I really love your book. And oh, part, you. what a, part of what I loved about it is you really share a lot about yourself and kind of how you live. Um, Miranda did a feature on Karen's outdoor entertaining. Um, but I think it really does help prospective clients get to know you get, just by kind of being open and sharing yourself. It, for sure, for sure. And um, I am, you know, an interior designer that specializes in kitchen and bathrooms. But I also have a love for entertaining. And you don't have to be, you know, fall into this little hole. You can be you. And it can expand. And you can have fun and make a business out of it. And if, if your role, as Darren said, is to kind of help your clients live an even better life, you yeah. know, you've got, part of that is sharing how you live. Yeah. Right? Uh, Elsie DeWolf said, I will make the world a more beautiful place, and that will be my life. I love it. And I say, I do make the world a more beautiful place, <laughs> and that is my life. <laughs> I love like, it. It's what we do. On that note, I think we should <laughs> ask for audience questions. <laughs> <coughs> Don't be shy, audience. Yes, Katie has a microphone. I have a microphone. She's gonna so um, bring it to you. You'll just give me two seconds. I can run in heels, I promise. Where am I going? Um, I had, um, thanks for coming. When you say um, you can do any style if you have taste, mm -hmm. can you expand on what your definition of taste is? <laughs> it's, it's something you have or you don't have. Um, and I, I mean that. Like, you can learn style you can't learn taste. Like, you've either got it or you don't. And if you have it, if you learn about what the other style is that the clients want, you will be able to put those elements together in a beautiful way. Mm. So it's, I, it's, I, I don't know, just this idea that people only do one thing. And there are, there are designers who brand themselves. Victoria Hagen. Victoria Hagen does the same house over and over again. She's made up fortune doing that. <laughs> I'm stupid. I want to do something new every single time, which is much harder. Um, it, it, it's exactly what I just said. If you just research, uh, if you go back through history and you see, like, if it's modern, look at the Italian designers from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and just see what they were doing. And if you've got the taste, you'll be able to put those elements together in a way that's fresh, attractive, and what they asked for. Can you train your eye? You have to train your eye. I mean, you have to look at things all the time. Do a million house tours. Go to Europe. Do garden tours in Europe. Yeah. I mean, yes. have you not seen every single garden in Europe? <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, have. And so. houses and uh, just uh, go through the museum and go through the textile wing and go through, like, just saturate your eyeballs. It's again like looking at images and something's gonna hook your eye. Mm. Something mm -hmm. after a while is gonna catch. You can always look back at those same images because who you are today, in 10 years, you will not be the same person. Mm. I understand. You have a higher appreciation for what was introduced to you before and I think that going back to some places is important too. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. Do you have a follow-up? So I wonder if what you're saying, taste, is because the phrase that I'm always using when people ask me what my style is, I say I steer towards timeless and elegant because it will be more lasting. And that say that again, like, I'm sorry. It seems like what you're saying about taste is timeless and elegant. Mm -hmm. and but not pinpointed to a certain... Respect. Yeah, it's, it's not one thing. Taste is not one thing. Like... You, you can look at all different genres and, and see it's well the done. quality in it, see the beauty in it, see the value in it. It's knowing when to stop. And it's knowing when to stop. <laughs> For sure. You know? It's true. It's true. <laughs> you it's know, true. a client will come to you and bring you a plethora of just, I love this, I love this, and they're all great, and 
something Darren was saying earlier, there is a common thread. And it's up for it's up to us to see that thread yeah. mm -hmm. and knowing at what point you stop, you know, because then it no longer is tasteful. Right. <laughs> right? right. For sure. Take one thing off. Look yep. in the mirror and take one thing. <laughs> and take a piece of jewelry off. Yeah. <laughs> Another question? Okay. Since this talk is about joy and design, I wanted to know if, um, when we talk about the issue of mental wellness and mental health, mm. um, and May is that's coming up, um, how what is the role of uh, designers, interior designers, to kind of uh, transform homes into spaces of mental wellness for those who are seeking that, allowing the home to be the first, the first space of uh, healing, um, yeah. when we're talking about that, and how and what is the role of design in doing that? It's a great question. For me, it would be go outside. We will create a beautiful garden for you. So enjoy the outdoors. But um, I mean, I'm not a therapist, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. But I think that. <laughs> yes, we are. We totally are. But, yeah. but, I, but I just think that um, uh, the joy uh, for what we could give to another uh, person I think that um, has to be with the mindset of that person is joyful and can see the goodness in what we have done for them. It's also, you have to, everybody has a different idea of sanctuary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you sort of have to figure out what, like some person's sanctuary is not a lot of clutter, super minimal, but texturally satisfying. And for other people, it's layer and layer and layer and layer and layer, so they see the history of their lives in their house. Exactly. So it's, you have to ask people, what's your sanctuary? You really have to listen. Yeah. And what brings you joy? Because you want to go home and get rid of the chaos of the world, and you want, whether you're dealing with mental health, we all want to heal ourselves, you know, from evening to morning, so we can go back out and do what we do best whatever that is. How, this is a kind of related question, but how does someone's feelings about his or her own home affect how he or she feels about him or herself? Sorry to go like pronoun crazy, but a lot. did you follow a me? Lot. <laughs> a lot. I mean, actually more when I was working in California than New York, um, because people entertain in their homes in California more than they, than they do in New York in general unless they have really amazing apartments. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it is very much so like a stage set for them. Like you're creating, you, you gotta figure out how they wanna live and then you create the space and the stage for them to be that person. And so there was a woman in New York, social woman in New York who wore like massive jewelry all the time, fake, but massive. And I asked her once, I was like, like what's your, like it's, and she said it's my armor. Like, this is what I put on before I go out to an intimidating black tie. And then I'm not intimidated. And yeah. it's sort of the same thing. Like, we can create a kitchen or a living room or a garden where when they're in that space, they are just on fire. Then that gives people a lot of strength. That's sort of the definition of success for yeah. you. Right. Yeah. Somebody had a question over here. Hi. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, my question is for Nando. In looking at the spaces that you've created, I see an awful lot of greenery. Uh, my question is, how much work do you do to incorporate uh, flowers, uh, plants that are native to the environment um, that you are uh, creating in, and what role does color play? How mm. much color do you bring into the mix? Just along the lines of the whole mental health piece and your home is your sanctuary, my, my deck in my backyard, even though I could kill the squirrels and take care of my pots, I still love all of that. So how much work do you do around creating and keeping, you know, local, native to the environment mm -hmm. stuff uh, within um, that? I, f I find uh, uh, gardens that are green and green quite um, amusing to me and calming to me. So I always tell the clients that my gardens are typically green and white, and I think you choose any other color, this is the moment that you can tell me what color, but it only has to be one. <laughs> <laughs> and I much more prefer to um, create a, a background for um, 
the life to unfold and where I can have outdoor furniture that can be for uh, the rainy season or the dry season or I can have something that it could be completely um, sort of like calming and soothing like that photograph. I think yeah. that that is, mm -hmm. you, you'll be amazed if you actually uh, create gardens that are green on green because you be, I will be able to perceive much more color. You can actually use uh, per Persian principles in where you can bring heaven to earth by those reflections in the pool. So Love that, that is yeah. kind of like my philosophy. If I bring colors, I typically have asked the client what color would that be? And we can always use that with wonderful outdoor fabrics or um, pottery or or hardscape, and you know, it's it's just very dynamic. I think that I will never be bored with what I do, and none of my clients will be bored just to step outside and enjoy the outdoors. There's there's a photo in this presentation I think that has that's very green, but there are large blue pots. Is that photo in this? Anyway, is it? It, it might it? be. And then there's another photo that I don't think is in this presentation that I've seen of yours that where there was colorful artwork in the garden. Mm. Is that acceptable? Like, you mean sculpture? <laughs> like sculpture? You stop me. Sculpture, yeah. <laughs> well, a sculpture, I, I typically have a sculptures in the garden, typically when the client have the piece, and then I accessorize the surroundings of that sculpture piece. Mm -hmm. There was one that it was called the Vader, and I actually created a water feature That's specifically yeah. for that sculpture. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to have a clear philosophy. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Any more, any more questions? Okay. I was just going to ask you about using um, artificial turf. Oh, oh that's. Well, um, I think I have been in. I two actually just got nervous when she asked. <laughs> I like, this might not go well. <laughs> I have, three, I have three different panels recently in which we talk about synthetic sod. Uh, synthetic sod. Synthetic sod. That, 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 that sounds so much prettier than artificial. It started with, uh, I think, the stadium. I think the, the, the football stadium, Astrodome, probably. Mm. That's where it was first tried out. Now the new technology, uh, what a company called Synlon is the one who are producing amazing products where even have a little bit of thash inside brown and um, just for all of you to know the key of the synthetic saw is the installers the ah. installers are the one who can make it or break it because uh, there's a lot of things that happens underneath that allow the synthetic saw to look their best as well as um, the application of the aggregates that goes inside those fibers that keeps those uh, synthetic blades of the lawn upright and um, have the appearance of very natural grass. I started using that first in grass joints and vehicular use, and later on I added on to the side because sometimes houses are too close together, there's not a lot of sun, and, and then I started using it around the pool, and mm. so the, these photos here is all natural, by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but not everybody have large homes, but uh, sometimes you can achieve the look that we see in these beautiful glossy magazines, such as Veranda, hello. <laughs> and then we can achieve that, and synthetic side could be a great solution for achieving that look as well. Just happy to know it's called synthetic side. <laughs> right? I like that word. <laughs> hey, it's lovely, another word. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Any more questions? Did you I've got a, your yeah, I've got a few more, the lightning round. Um, uh -oh. Okay, I'm gonna ask, one question and want all three of you to answer and we'll go through. So first and foremost, the best thing you've seen lately? It can be anything. It doesn't even have to be related to a house. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Best thing I've seen lately. Could be a show, could be a menu. Oh, be... I saw really, I, I saw two things. I, I never go to Broadway musicals, I can't stand them. They drive me crazy, like why are people singing, just talk. <laughs> but my daughters were in town and they wanted to go see um, a funny lady and we went and it was amazing. And the other thing, there's a movie called, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about these people on a boat 
very rich people, and they get marooned on an island. Oh. And do you know what I'm talking I think about? I know what you're What's talking it called? Glass onion. No. That's what I, I was thinking. No. It was glass it, there's onion. another one. It's really sick. It was so good. It was beautifully. It was just. Did you see it in the theater? No, I. I, I, I I'm at home. And I was like, oh. Fernando, what's the best thing you've seen lately? Oh, uh, amazing thing that I saw lately was probably last year that I went to Vole Vicon, a mm. palace in France. Yes. And I was mesmerized. I have never seen anything so beautiful in my life. There were fireworks at the end of the dinner. It was just really uh, amazing. The and gardens there are spectacular. Yeah, and I, luckily I'm going to go back this year as well. So. And I think there's a relatively new book about yes. that palace. Alexandre Vogue, which is the count who's um, running the foundation, has yes. this. Uh, events in which I highly recommend it if you ever get the invitation, uh, book it immediately because uh, it's quite beautiful. It's just so beautiful. So beautiful that land him in jail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the original guy. The original guy, the, the finance minister of France and the court of Louis XIV was the one who created the palace. And that after that party, the first night, he went to jail. <laughs> wow. But didn't it, it sort of inspired Louis XIV to it do Versailles? It inspired Louis XIV yeah. yeah. hugely. Yeah. But uh, that is true. He looked at the, his palace and he went, wait, you're the finance minister. If you have this much money, you must be stealing. Yeah. <laughs> you're gone. Yeah, you're gone. off of his head. <laughs> yeah. Karen, what's the best thing you've seen lately? Um, I, I think it was early this year. I went to, um, I was in Puebla, Mexico, and I saw the Museum of Tile. Ooh. And there was a whole kitchen done with these beautiful colored um, tiles, and I was just, it was so happy. Yeah. And it was so amazing, and it was so simple. I love and that. Um, yeah, it made me. I did not I even know it. said museum existed. Yeah. That's amazing. I love it. Puebla. In Puebla. And the, um, the food was really good. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even better. Yeah. OK, next question. The one that got away. You define mm. that how you will. Wow. Hmm. I feel like His name was Bill. That's I was I, thinking so I think, the same thing. I was like, I think I should I call on Darren first. <laughs> <laughs> I can't could think be, of Could be an antique. It could be a house. It could be Bill. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there was a house in Nantucket. So we go to Nantucket in the summer, and I have an apartment in the city, and then I had a house in the country, and we were going to Nantucket in the summer. And on Nantucket Island, there were only three wooden Victorian houses mm. because just at that time period, they invented electricity, and so whale oil was no longer needed, and so suddenly there was no money on, Long on, on Nantucket. And we put in a bid on this house because I had to have it. It was one of three. It was amazing. And we get home and to Millbrook. And like there was a problem with the gardener. And the pool guy didn't do something. And this guy didn't do something. And I literally called him. I was like, I don't want another house. Like, I, I, can't, just don't I can't do it. So it kind of got away. But it was like, I can't. I and can't. do you ever look back and think, oh, sometimes? Yeah. yeah. But shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah. The one that got away. I don't, I don't really can mention anything because it's what Ugh. is happening. It's like whatever. It, There's always a next one. Whatever, yeah. whatever it is, is, is what's happening. I it's meant to be. It's me <laughs> que sera, sera. Um, we'll start with you on the next one then, Fernando. Uh, mm. Next trip you're planning. I'll be in Rome this Saturday. Oh, oh. This wow. Good for you. I'll be in That's uh, day after tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> in Lake Como for. That the, sounds good. The weekend, and then I'll be back in Rome. Fabulous. It, work, play, combo? A little bit of both. That's yeah. the best so way to Como do it. is pleasure. Rome is a little bit of work. That's great. Excellent. Excellent. Darren? Um, I actually do not have any trips planned, but my 15-year-old twin daughters are literally touring Europe this summer. Ugh, good um, for them. So I'm living through them, but I might at some point go meet one of them somewhere. Are they playing any tennis in Europe? Uh, they're doing tennis camp in the south of France. Cool. And one of them's going to Lake Lugano to study French, intensive French, for four weeks. The other one's going to Oxford to do creative writing. Cool. So 
Good for them. Oh my god. I'm, I'm gonna live I vicariously. So want to well. live like my kid. I know. I love it's it. It's good. I have to pay for it. Oh, like, somebody's got to work. <laughs> it's depressing. <laughs> it's not right. Karen, what about you? Next trip you're planning? Um, next month I am going to. I'm first of all going to do um, part of the Camino walk that goes oh, from cool. France to Spain. I can't take that much time off, but I'm going to do it for four days. And then we're going to Boys. Provence, renting a villa in Provence. Oh, mm, dreamy. Nice. So dreamy. Like, Just do nothing. And Nerman Herbs. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, I'm really as a as a winemaker, do, do you sort of find yourself traveling to other wine regions? For sure, yeah. for sure. We're gonna actually from Spain to Provence. We're gonna stop in Burgundy. <laughs> to My up. partner will only go where there's wine, I so love it. it's I love a it. joint trip. So <laughs> I have to go along with it. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. You know, whatever we have to do. Um, finally, no home is complete without a dog. He's got it. Gotta have a dog. A plant. A plant, <laughs> of course. Just something. <laughs> Synthetic sod. <laughs> a great kitchen. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you all Wait, so much. Wait, Darren, oh. was your movie uh, Triangle of Sadness? Yes. Well, ding, ding, what ding, was ding, it? Ding, ding, ding. Triangle of Sadness. Watch this movie. It's It's... Repulsive yet so beautiful. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Perfect <laughs> ending. To it was an Oscar. <laughs> yeah, it was an Oscar nom. <laughs> Triangle of sadness. Yeah, yeah, it was an Oscar nom. This is year. it? Wait, did you say it is like beautifully? It's, it's all visually very stimulating? attractive in a twisted Wes Anderson sort oh, of way. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's I good. Love it. Great. Well, thank you. Please join us in the Made Goods showroom for a book signing and reception. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.